Hello F1 fans and welcome to F1 on and off the track with Kim Illman. You can see his photos at ProStarPicks.com, subscribe to his YouTube channel or follow him on Instagram at Kim Illman. My name is Adrian and in this episode we're talking about the Mexican GP. How did it go Kim? Well it rained uh, after the race very heavily but luckily I was back in the media centre so that didn't have any effect on me but um, it's just the most magnificent race that somebody asked someone else in the media bus today what they thought their best race was. And I, I, I thought, yeah, Mexico's right up there. It's a lovely atmosphere. And I really think um, if they didn't have that stadium, it wouldn't be anywhere near as good. But you've got to understand that at the end, instead of going back to pit lane and uh, parking and then going upstairs to a podium, they park in the stadium. So the top three cars come and park in the stadium. And then the uh, top three drivers go up onto the podium. And for the first time this year, Lewis Hamilton, because he won, his car was pushed up a ramp. And then he stood on top of his car. And when it came time for him to be announced to go up onto the podium, he, he got onto the podium by being raised up through this area, through this stage area, and that the car actually sat in front of the, um, the drivers. And it was very impressive to see. And straight after that, we had Tiesto pumping out dance music, unbelievable volume. It was a full-on concert. Now, in fact, um, earlier today, uh, and we're recording this, um, what time is it here? 9.26 p.m. on a Sunday night after the race. And this actually works out very well because Adrian's in the office in Perth, and I'm still up. Um, often the times it doesn't work that way, so this is where we're getting this out really quickly. Um, yeah, this guy walked in, big fella, and uh, people were going nuts, running around, and I thought, oh, I'd better get over there and take a photo. And then I saw someone else with Tiesto crew, I thought, well, it must be him, and he was with a very attractive woman, so I said, look, can we get a photo of you two together? I gathered they were girlfriend or wife, and it turns out it was his wife, Annika Backus, I think her name is, and yeah, uh, it was nice to see him, because I, I quite like his music, although when he was up on stage, I think, is he actually playing anything? Is he doing anything or is he just standing there and he's got a loop tape on and he's just dancing around? But look, he had the attention of the crowd and it was a beautiful thing to be involved in. So it's quite theatrical, this Park Ferme. Oh, it's amazing. There's probably, I'm thinking, twenty to 30,000 people in there. Every seat is full. And it's really spine-tingling when Checo Perez comes through and he did it on Saturday. Uh, I was up, no, Friday I was up there. No, Saturday in qualifying. The first time he came around in qualifying, the place just went crazy. And I just stopped. I didn't photograph at that moment. I just thought, no, I want to stand here and enjoy the moment. It was uh, a real spine-tingling thing. Now, Daniel Kvyat was caught blowing you a kiss. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I took one of these cutouts where I, it was actually his wife's or girlfriend's face. And I just cut out a hole there and put my lens through it and popped up in front of him after he'd finished an interview and it really took him by surprise and he was a bit quizzical at first and then he laughed and then I took the thing away from my face and uh, I've, I've spoken to him a few times so he knows me to talk to and then I put my camera back up and he uh, came over and blew me a kiss so I got this lovely photo that I wouldn't have got if I hadn't have prompted him with this funny prop that uh, he saw the, the funny side of which was great. I believe you got to go with Kimmy as well. Yeah, it didn't work out quite so well there was no interest at all there so uh, I'm done with that one now, but I, I thought it was a, a fun idea to at least engage the drivers because I do know that they really don't have that much engagement with the photographers. They, they tend to just walk past and it's all very perfunctory, but yeah, it, I think it doesn't hurt to add a bit of fun and colour to the, to the sport. Uh, can you tell us about the salmon? This is a, a thing that Lando Norris does, but before I tell you that, uh, earlier today, I, I saw on his uh, social media that he was considering wearing one of these gruesome face masks, the stretch, stretchy ones that fit over your face. And it's almost like a half a balaclava thing that's got some teeth or skeletons things. And he it was threatening to wear it. And I thought, right, I know what he's doing at a certain time because I knew, I knew he had to do a, a commitment upstairs in the uh, paddock club. So I thought, I'll go down a few minutes before and I'll take some photos of him coming out of the uh, hospitality suite, which I did. And they were nice wide angled shots and... Um, then I, he went upstairs, and then I had a look at the photos in detail. I zoomed in, and I thought, saw this bandana around his neck or this face mask pulled down, but around his neck. And I thought, well, I'll hang around. It's probably only 10, 15 minutes before he comes back, and I'll see if he actually wears it. And don't get me dead. I was so lucky because he walked down the stairs, and he went to go through the swipe gates, and he saw me, and he just put it up, and he came through the swipe gates, and I took, I don't know, six frames, and he was gone. 
and he walked 20 metres back to the hospitality suite and I gather he took it off there. So really, uh, if you looked at my Instagram feed, you think, oh, he's probably walking around with that all day, but really, it was no more than about 10 seconds. If it was that, probably five, but a really great response. So that was in the morning. And in the afternoon, I was told that he does a thing called the salmon, <clears throat> and I'd never heard of it, but look, I imagine if you're a ardent follower of his Instagram, perhaps it's popped up there before. So here's what happens. He goes down to the mechanics and the mechanics form a line, might be 10 or 12 of them. And he runs and jumps into their arms and then they hold him and then they tickle him and he squirms around <laughs> like a salmon, giggling and carrying on. And it's a really funny thing to watch. So I was lucky enough to shoot that today. And I haven't put those pictures up yet um, because of the time difference. Most of my audience is in Europe. So if you put anything up now, it is um, very early hours of the morning, so it's pretty much wasted. But later on today, I'll put that up. And certainly by the time this has gone out, it should be visible on my Instagram page at Kim Elman. But very funny photos and a lovely thing to be around. And, you know, he's only 19 and he's, he's a good character. You wouldn't get that with a lot of the drivers. So you take those opportunities when they pop up. There's also a great shot of him in a reflection of a puddle. Yeah, that because the sunrise is quite late here, I went on Saturday morning, about seven o'clock I arrived at the track and I went out and shot some stuff in pit lane in, in the dark. And it's really lovely stuff because I never do pit practice in the dark. So that they were quite unique shots. And then I went back to uh, f photograph the drivers coming in through the swipe gates into the paddock. And there was this big puddle of water. And I thought, oh, well, I'll have a crack at some of these reflection shots. I haven't had too much luck in the past, but I'll give it another go. And a few drivers came in and they would sort of walk near the puddle, but not into it. And uh, I actually wasn't looking when Lando came in. So he'd already got halfway towards me. So he's probably 20 metres into the 50 metres or 40 metre walk that he had to make. And so I grabbed my camera and I got in position and uh, I was thankful that he walked towards me and he took a couple of steps into the puddle. So what I had was, uh, I had a photo where you see the reflection of him in the puddle and then you see him real life above the puddle. So it's quite a long photo. And it was too long to fit on Instagram. So I edited it on my phone, as I often do. And of course, if another driver comes through, I've got to stop editing, go and take their photos, and then come back to my editing. So anyway, I looked at the picture and thought, it's too long for Instagram. I'll cut it off, and I'll cut it off just where he's uh, probably halfway up his leg. And then I decided, no, I'll flip the thing upside down completely. So when you look at the picture on my Instagram account from Saturday, you look at it and you think, it's an interesting shot of Lando Norris walking, but then you look at the bottom of the shot and you see where his, because you're looking at the reflection, you're actually not looking at him. And then you see the part where his reflection meets his real foot and you go, oh, oh, it's upside down. Now I get it. Wow, it was, it was, probably, it was probably my biggest post uh, of any driver. There's been other bigger posts, but they were um, different sort of posts. But yeah, it was one of my best posts and, uh, yeah, he ended up running on his page, so he must have liked it. I had that exact same reaction where I looked at it and then saw his foot and was like, oh, this is upside down. And uh, that's what I love yes. about it. Yeah, because when you look at it, you think it looks a bit grainy and um, some of the pictures missing. What's going on? And the writing's backwards. Why is the writing backwards? That's all this, the intricate things that you look at when you look deeply into a photo. Well, speaking of different unique ways to shoot, I believe you took a tilt shift lens. How did that go? Yeah, I don't use that very often. And uh, for those who don't know what a tilt shift lens is, it's a little hard to explain, but effectively, if you've seen photos from overhead or from a height and it looks like a toy scene, perhaps it's of a railway line, it looks like a toy scene, that's shot with a tilt shift. So instead of the focus plane being a certain distance from the camera, you can actually set it top to bottom in the middle of the frame, left to right in the middle of the frame. You can go diagonal, top of the frame, bottom of the frame. So I set it up shooting from the top of the grandstand so that you... You pretty much follow the car's path and you get everything left and right of that is out of focus. And it's an interesting look. It certainly takes people by surprise. And I do like shooting with it, although you wouldn't do it every day. It's, it's a novelty sort of thing. F1 On and Off the Track is presented by ProStarPix.com. Stunning F1 photos live from the track, searchable and downloadable for personal or editorial use. Head to ProStarPix.com at the end of this podcast. Speaking of novelties, there are some Polaroid shots of you and of Charles. What's the story behind those? Carlo Albanese is a brilliant photographer from Italy and uh, he carries with him a Polaroid camera. It's actually a Fuji, but it shoots 
pictures that you can see straight away. And he took a picture of me and then I held it up and he took a picture with my camera, I think, yeah, with my camera with uh, me in focus in the picture and, and out of focus in real life. And he also took one of Charles and I did the same thing as Charles walked back into the pit. And yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting way of um, taking a picture of someone who's in a picture. And um, once again, you can see that on my page and also mentioned it in uh, my blog on Thursday evening. The paddock also looked very vibrant. Yeah, it is, until it rains and then it's, it's completely devoid of any people. But, yeah, they did a great job of painting like a facade, uh, a really brightly lit facade of a Mexican street. And, of course, the glamour shot was you get a driver walking past that on his own. And on the Thursday, that's what we managed to get, all the drivers rolling up for the press conference. Most of them walk past this facade so you get these beautiful shots and looks like they're out on a streetscape somewhere and then the other side of that is um a taco stand and this is all free food and drink there's a uh, my son eats these things sugar and um pastry things churro stuff whatever that is uh, there's an ice cream stand there was a tequila stand there was a heineken bar and a barber shop you could go in there and have a shave not so much a haircut but they mainly did beards now that caused everyone to hang around for a long time uh, longer than what you would normally would because on a, on a typical race, I wouldn't go out. There's hardly any tracks that have that sort of setup. So it was a really good social scene and anybody who was in the paddock would have made use of that and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Pierre seemed to be a little sick leading into the race. Well, he was sick for qualifying. Um, he woke up on Saturday morning with a temperature of 40 degrees and he didn't do too much in FP1. He was as sick as a dog. Now, I think it was uh, a flu or stomach, or some sort of virus anyway. And it hit him bad. And in fact, there were probably a hundred odd people in the whole paddock that had some sort of nasty thing, whether it was um, Montezuma's Revenge, which is similar to Barley Belly. And Australians would know that. But there was a lot of people laid low by some sort of health issue and he was caught up in that as well but luckily he managed to get into the car for a, a couple of laps in the morning and then in quali he came out and he set the 10th fastest time and when he emerged his temperature was 37 degrees or 38 degrees still so he, he was um, in a pretty poor way but ended up doing a great job in fact i photographed him when he came out of um, the fia garage after quali and he went straight to his trainer, took a couple of pills of something. And, um, yeah, he looked not distressed, but he didn't look comfortable. But this morning I asked him how he was when he came in. He said, yeah, a lot better. And his parents were there today too. Uh, and I took a lovely photo of them just uh, in the paddock earlier today. So I don't even know where he finished. It wasn't that flash. I remember him at the back of the field at some point. But, uh, well, that's the thing. Yeah. Oftentimes, what am I now? 20 minutes to 10, and I still haven't really worked out what's going on because we have, I probably had two and a half hours of editing after I'd gone out and done a few other things after the race. It's quite hectic and um, not that I'm complaining, but it, oftentimes we don't actually understand what happened in the race until we get a few minutes to flick through the F1 site and see what's actually transpired. Let's change gears and move the discussion over to the US GP that's coming up. And what's the trip from Mexico to USA like? Two hours and 20 on a plane and flying to Dallas. And then it was a third of the price to stay in the, stay in the Dallas hotel than it was to stay in an Austin hotel because the whole of the F1 crew are moving over, I imagine, en masse and booking up all the hotel rooms. Normally, when you go in to an F1 city, the Monday and Tuesday night before the race or a normal race, and it bumps up maybe Wednesday or Thursday, but not the case with this one. So it's a couple of days in Dallas and I'll drive, it's probably three hours to uh, Austin. And then we'll just get ringed a big time by the hotels there. They certainly know how to charge. Well, where's the track located and what's the track itself like? It's a purpose-built thing and they spent plenty of money on it. And it's got lots of uh, painting, big wide runoff areas with stars and stripes. Um, it's about a 25-minute drive from the city, a really nice drive. It's um, not like the track here. 25 minutes in peak hour here, you'd go about 4Ks. But good car parking, well-visited well race. And I think if you've... If you've come to this race, it's just a short hop, skip and a jump to go to that one. So, yeah, we tend to like the American race. There's a beautiful press centre for us, a media centre. It's almost like a big ballroom with monster screens. They feed us. Facilities are fantastic. And they've got buses that run inside and outside the track, which is always good if you want to get to the far end of a track to take a particular photo. And the one I do like to take is a cresting shot where the cars come over a, 
well, it's a crest. And there's that huge, big observation tower, uh, which is on the right or behind them as they come over. Yeah, it's a really lovely shot. You shoot through the wire, and some of the photographers actually take out a texture, and they colour the wire black because it's a little bit better to shoot through black wire than it is to shoot through silver wire if the sun is coming from a certain direction, perhaps, and reflecting back into it. You mentioned an observation tower. Is that accessible for photographers? It is, actually. We, we share it with just general spectators, and there's a lift that goes up, although uh, it wasn't working one day, and I'd committed to doing some photos up there for a client, so I walked up, and my God, it was a shocking bloody trip up there. It <laughs> took about six, seven minutes, and it's just really steep so you really are thankful when you get the lift up but you do get some lovely photos uh, and you can see for quite you can perhaps yeah i think you can see almost all of the circuit from up there it's a tremendous view how how was the turnout for the us gp good they uh, they get a good roll up uh, look i don't think they get anything like the numbers here in mexico because they don't have perhaps the, quite the seating but uh, yeah i think it's a popular race and of course they're planning on a second U.S. race in 2021 in Miami, uh, which will be interesting because that, that'll be a street circuit as opposed to this track, which is purpose-built. Yeah, I, I think it'd be great to go to Miami. I just, uh, I just hope they, and I'm pretty sure they won't make it one race in um, Austin and the next week in Miami. That would be flooding the market. I'm sure they'll be um, separated by some, some period of time. But I'll be going and I will look forward to saying in Miami and once again, they'll be charging top dollar. It's, you know, it's funny because everywhere we go, it's peak rate for the hotels. You never get a deal. What can we look forward to from your YouTube videos in the coming week or so? Well, one's going up tonight on the grid. That's tonight, uh, Australian time this afternoon, European time. And uh, that talks about how the grid works because everybody watches it on telly. And I'm sure they think, gee, I'd love to be down there. And I was down there today, and it is full on, hectic and exciting. And you've got to have your wits about you, otherwise you'll get cleaned up. But I go into some of the detail about what happens on the grid. And that's on Monday night tonight. And then on Friday, I'll probably put up one about one of the drivers. And this week, I've picked Pierre Gasly. When it comes to the grid, are there different traditions at different places? Or is it all kind of standard across all of them? No, it's pretty much standard with the car side of things. Some some tracks have uh, a, a dancing or music as well, uh, but that's always the other side of where they have the national anthem, or right up the back before they, the cars get there. But that that would they would never do it at the same time the cars are coming onto the track. By the way, I took actually took a lovely photo today of Charles Leclerc driving along pit lane and um, before they go out onto the grid, and I just put the camera on the ground and shot blind, and they looked nothing most of the time almost all the time you get nothing because in, you're not quite sure where the hell you're aiming at or where the focus point's going to hit, hit but i really got a cracker of a shot today so that features in my blog as well so that's pretty much it adrian and i think uh, i now have to go and have something else to eat because uh, i've neglected that today too much running around taking photos but i think today and i'll tell you exactly how many pictures i put up online today i put up 357 today 389 yesterday, 307 the day before, and 217. So that's about 20% more than I normally put up. And this week, by the way, I've got women of the paddock, and I've been hammered by so many women, mainly, you know, in fact, all women, about when are you going to do men of the paddock? So I've had to, uh, I guess, acquiesce to their demand, and I've now found 10 blokes that we'll put up there who aren't drivers or team bosses. So uh, men and women of the paddock, one will go up Monday night, um, one of our Tuesday night. Well, thank you very much for your time then. We'll see you after the USGP. Well, yeah, I'll be coming back and sitting with you in your office in a week and a half. So thank you to all those lovely people that came up and said hello this weekend. It was really lovely. Uh, marshals, punters, um, people who work in the industry. And it's just lovely feedback to, to know that people are actually looking at the stuff that I'm putting out, mainly on Instagram. To see any of the photos we've talked about today, head over to ProStarPics.com. You can also stay updated by following Kim on Instagram at Kim Ehrman or seeing his latest videos by subscribing on YouTube. If you like what you heard today, please give us a review and remember to hit subscribe to stay posted for our next episode. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you on and off the track. F1 on and off the track was presented by ProStarPics.com. Stunning F1 photos live from the track Searchable and downloadable for personal or editorial use. ProStarPix.com. Head there now.